Thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm Kuei Nguyen, Head of our Product Management at Research Affiliates. Today, I'm joined by our founding chairman, Rob Arnott, to discuss RAFI in a changing market landscape. Before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone who has already submitted questions and invite you to submit questions during the webinar using the Q&A widget on your screen. Also, you'll see a list of resources available for download, including the slide deck and a link to our website and our interactive tools, Smart Beta Interactive and Asset Allocation Interactive. In today's webinar, Rob will be discussing RAFI, the Research Affiliates Fundamental Index, in the context of a changing market landscape. We'll cover the principles of the Fundamental Index, recent performance, and forward-looking expectations. To set the stage, let's take a quick look at the recent market movements. Last year, equity markets extended the rebound from COVID lows of 2020. Global equities saw exceptionally strong performance while investors abandoned risk-off assets such as gold. The first quarter of 2022 has turned this dynamic on its head. Investors flocked back to gold while equities declined. While the war in the Ukraine may have been a catalyst in this shift, there are also increasingly challenging macro trends in equities in the form of substantial inflation pressures. CPI, which was less than 2% a year ago, is now running close to 9% at 8.5% and the oil price has almost doubled. A natural question is how RAFI fares in such regime shifts? To delve into this question, I'll turn it over to Rob to begin with the principles of RAFI. Rob? Thank you very much, Kwe. Uh, a revisiting of core principles, I think, is, is awfully helpful because RAFI is a lot more nuanced than simply weighting companies according to how big they are, although that's the fundamental concept. With market cap weighting. The more expensive a company is, the more weight it gets in your portfolio. Now, think about it this way. If you have a bigger allocation to a particular company than another, tacitly that must mean you like it better, that you want to own more of it. Why would you want to own more of it after the price doubled than before it doubled? Rafi takes that whole concept and says, well, why are we waiting based on something that's directly tied to price? Why don't we wait on how big the business is? And that means that companies that are priced at a premium, the beloved companies, are downweighted to their economic footprint. So the growth companies, the popular companies that everyone knows and loves, are typically weighted down. Companies that are trading at deep discounts are upweighted to their economic footprint. Now, how do you measure the economic footprint? There's lots of ways to do it. Uh, we use, for example, sales adjusted for debt equity ratio, uh, cash flow adjusted for intangibles, dividends plus stock buybacks, book value adjusted for intangibles. These are all measures of how much a company sells, how much it profits, how much it gives back to the shareholders, and what the effective net worth of the business is based on the profits that are retained and the money that's invested in intangibles. The important thing is not to get the weight right. The important thing is to have a stable anchor to contra-trade against the market's constantly changing views. So sure, the growth stocks, you'll say, thank you for those lovely gains. I'm going to reweight you down. Value stocks, you'll say, thank you for the deep discount. I'll reweight you up. But more important, the market's constantly changing its mind. So you're going to contra-trade against the market's shifting views. This gives it a contrarian flavor, and it has a distinct value focus. You can see that in this table that shows the performance of RAFI going back over 1, 3, 5, and 10 years. And, of course, year-to-date, just the uh, opening months of uh, the current year. Globally, what we can see is against value, we've added value over all spans except for one year with a 10 basis point shortfall. Developed, we've outperformed value again over all spans except for a slight shortfall over one year. For the U.S., all spans. For emerging markets, all spans except the current year to date. And we'll come back to that in a, a few minutes. But uh, against the broad market, it's a more mixed picture. In emerging markets, we've beat the MSCI Emerging Markets Index over all spans, year to date, one year, three year, five year, 10 year, even though value underperformed uh, over 
the three, five, and 10 year spans. So you'll see the value add over the broad market, 60 basis points, even though value um, uh, underperformed the broad market by 1.6% over that span. The other thing that's interesting to note is that we beat value when value's losing, and we beat value when value's winning. So that winds up being a, a very compelling statement about the relative efficacy of RAFI in a broad array of market conditions. So Rob, uh, value's been underperforming, but value stocks have been underperforming largely because they're underperforming their fundamentals and they're trading at steep discounts now. Uh, how do you view this situation today as similar or different from what we saw in the tech bubble? You know, this is awfully reminiscent of the tech bubble. During the tech bubble, we saw uh, categories of uh, tech stocks, notably internet companies, soaring to vast valuation multiples. We're seeing that again now. We saw concentration in the global markets. Six of the 10 largest market cap companies in the world were tech companies. And coming into this year, it was nine of the 10 largest market cap companies were tech companies. Now, to be sure, Amazon's a retailer, but really its competitive advantage is tech. And so um, when you view things from that perspective, this is the most concentrated list ever, even more concentrated than at the peak of the tech bubble. This graph shows the performance of the classic Fama French value factor. Now, what is that? You take the 30% of the market that's most expensive, that's growth. You take the 30% that's cheapest on price to book value, that's value. You cap weight those two portfolios and you track the difference between them. So the blue line against the left scale, which is a log scale, shows the performance of the value factor going back to 1963. And you'll note that it finishes at a level of about five. What's the intuition behind that? Say your great grandparents had bought the Fama French value portfolio and their next door neighbors had bought the growth portfolio. You would now have inherited a portfolio worth five times as much as the heirs of that next door neighbor. That's wonderful. Except if you stopped right here in 2007, uh, you would have had 10 times as much wealth. So this drawdown from point D to the trough here just before point E was a stupendous drawdown. Uh, we've seen drawdowns before. We saw it in the Nifty 50. We saw it in the oil crisis. We saw it in the biotech bubble, the big tech bubble, a short, sharp one in the global financial crisis. And now this doozy. Now, it's interesting to note, if you use measures other than price to book value, the peak isn't necessarily 2007. In fact, it typically isn't. If you use price to sales, for instance, it's 2017. So this peak was higher than the peak back in 2007 if you're using price to sales. But no matter how you define value, this meltdown from 2017 to late 2020, a three and a half year meltdown, was brutal to value managers and was the largest drawdown in history. So what happened? We wrote a paper that was very controversial back in 2016 uh, entitled, How Can Smart Beta Go Horribly Wrong? In it, we advanced the highly provocative thesis that just like a stock can get ahead of its fundamentals or behind its fundamentals, a factor like this, or a strategy like a PE-based strategy, can get ahead of itself or behind itself. And the market will pay different relative valuation multiples at different times. Where this gets interesting is you look at this tech bubble where value underperformed growth, or most people think of it the other way around, that growth soared and value didn't, but relative to the growth, value tanked by over 40%. Note that the relative cheapness of value tanked by over 50%. Think about that. If you have a stock that's down 40% and... Um, its relative valuation is down 50%. That means its earnings have grown even as it's been tanking relative to the broad market. Well, that's wonderful. Had this chart been around during the tech bubble, 
it's reasonable to think that lots of investors would have looked at this and said, wow, I'd better stay the course. And if I can possibly persuade my investment committee to allow me to buy more, I really ought to buy more. By the time we got to point D, the relative valuation, the green line, over on the right had risen to just under 0.25. What does 0.25 mean? It means that the value portfolio is one-fourth as expensive as the growth portfolio. That sounds like a huge gap. It's not. A 5 to 1 ratio is normal. At the peak of the tech bubble, it got to 9 to 1. All right, that means that tech companies were nine times as expensive as value companies. That's a pretty huge spread. In the aftermath of the COVID crash, uh, that blew out to a 12 to 13 to 1 ratio. Cheaper relative to growth and relative to the market than it was at the peak of the tech bubble. So, this graph tells us a lot of things. One, it says that the ups and downs of the strategy of value relative to growth are joined at the hip with the ups and downs of relative valuation. The gap between the two lines is the structural alpha associated with value. And note that that's continued to get wider since point D, even since this interim peak in 2017. This entire meltdown 58% from point D to the trough uh, was accompanied by the market getting cheaper by 70%, the value stocks getting cheaper by 70%. Again, if your stock is down 58% and the price to book is down uh, 70%, that tells you the book value has gone up. This means that the book value of the value portfolio was growing faster than the book value of the growth portfolio. So when we looked at this, we wrote an article uh, that came out at the beginning of last year entitled, Reports of Value's Death Have Been Greatly Exaggerated. And in that paper, we made two basic points. One, that book value is a terrible measure for how big or how prosperous a business is. And secondly, that value beat growth absent its revaluation downward. If you were still priced at the same relative valuations as you were in 2007, value would have beat growth by 1% to 2% a year. Isn't that interesting? It means that the entire meltdown was explained by value becoming cheaper. Now, if we look at the COVID shock, we find that the crash, the COVID crash, was particularly brutal on value. Uh, value... Um, uh, tanked 42%, uh, the broad market tanked um, uh, 34%, and RAFI, because of its value tilt, tanked, but by less than the value factor itself. In the value-driven rebound, which went from the end of the uh, uh, COVID crash until mid-June of 2021, we found the opposite. The market was up 92%, RAFI was up 109%, and a concentrated value factor portfolio was up 138%. So by this time, you'd recouped the entire shortfall relative to the S&P and relative to conventional measures of value. Then growth had a big snapback from June of 2021 until year end. Uh, the S&P up 13.6%. Uh, RAFI up six, so we g gave back uh, 700 basis points, and a pure play on deep value, the RAFI value factor, actually down slightly. That flipped, and in the opening quarter of this year, uh, RAFI beat the S&P 500 by just under 5%, and the value factor by just over 11%. So what we find is that there's been this Impressive volatility, dramatic seesaw factor, but the net effect is this strategy by rebalancing into deeper value when value is struggling and rebalancing out of deep value when value is rebounding winds up making more on the recoveries than is lost on the drawdowns. So this, this rebalancing factor is a very key component of Rafi's success. Today, as we look at the market, it's highly concentrated. The top five names in the S&P have always been a big part of the S&P. Anywhere from 10% of the entire S&P 500 in just five names to 20%. Well, it reached a peak um, during the aftermath of the um, 
uh, COVID crash, the five uh, largest market cap companies in the U.S. and the five largest in the world, all members of what we call the fan mags. Those are the FANG stocks uh, plus the survivors from the Generation 1 tech bubble, Apple and Microsoft. Put those companies together, take away Netflix because it's not in the top five, and you've got an aggregate weight of about 23% as of the end of 2021. Uh, 23% in five stocks? That's enormous. And if you look at history, what you find is way back in 1975, you had nearly 20% in the top five names. What were they? ATT, IBM, Exxon, Kodak, General Motors, World Straddling Colossi, not one of which is in the top 10 anymore. The top 10 changes. And the top 10 in today's market don't even have much in the way of dividends. Most of them have none to cushion you if they fall from their perch. It's interesting that you mentioned the fan mag stocks. Everybody knows what they are. They are the darlings. Um, and many people say that they deserve these valuations because they have extraordinarily high margins and impenetrable moats. Um, how would you respond to that viewpoint? They have moats. So did the top five of every past cycle. Um, the essence of disruption is finding that the d moats don't matter. Disruptors get disrupted. Now, if we look at the fan mag stocks, their aggregate value uh, as of the end of March was just over $9 trillion. Now, to most of us, $9 trillion is just a very, very big number. Uh, let's put it into a context. You could buy the entire publicly traded Chinese economy, the whole country's economy, for nine and a half trillion. You could buy Japan for five and a half trillion. You could buy the three largest economies in Europe for less than the value of these six companies. Three European countries, the largest of them, for less than these six names. So this is really a remarkable testament to how expensive the fan mags are. Uh, they are very expensive. They are priced for perfection. They are priced as if those six companies will be a larger part of the future global economy than any country in the world except China and almost edging China out. That is a huge bet on the future of these companies. So what you're really saying, and you said this earlier, is that waiting by cap is like driving by looking at the rearview mirror. Uh, and I guess that, that works, right? Because the road is straight away, mm -hmm. which it was for a while, it works very well. But once the road starts to turn, um, you get some accidents. And so I guess the question is, you know, how bad are the accidents and how quickly does the road turn? One way we like to look at this is looking at what we call top dogs, the companies that are largest market cap in their sector, in their country, or in the world. These are the 10 top dogs, largest market cap companies on the planet, uh, decade by decade back to 1980. Now, if you look at 1980, wow, 10 out of 10 were U.S. stocks. That's interesting. Half of them were energy stocks. This was the, the, the oil bubble. These companies, how did they fare? Over the next 10 years, they were presumed to more or less own the world because they controlled where power comes from. And lo and behold, 10 years later, two stocks survived, IBM and ExxonMobil, both way down the list. 10 out of 10 of the top 10 names in 1980 underperformed the MSCI World Index over the next 10 years. 10 out of 10. And those were your 10 largest holdings if you were indexing. Which brings us to 1990. Eight out of ten are Japanese stocks. Japan was going to take over the world. And lo and behold, uh, they didn't. Roll the clock forward ten years. How many survivors were there? Two. You had ExxonMobil, which rose from uh, uh, tenth place to eighth, and NTT, which fell from first place to seventh. So, Another big rotation, nine out of 10 
underperformed the MSCI World Index, 8 out of 10 underperformed by enough to fall clear off the list. Which brings us to a new end of decade, year 2000. These were the 10 largest by market cap worldwide. And 6 of the 10 are tech, uh, tech or telecom of one variant or another. How many of these survived over the next 10 years? Well, this time you had three. You had Microsoft fall to third place, Walmart stay flat, and uh, ExxonMobil rise from eighth to second place. You had eight out of the 10 underperform the MSCI World Index, uh, seven out of the 10 underperform by enough to fall clear off the list. So you see a pattern forming here? Well, 2010, we finally have an end of decade that isn't a bubble. You had the oil bubble, the Japan bubble, the tech bubble, and now you've got representation from all over the world, from multiple sectors of the global economy, maybe because it's not a bubbly list, maybe this time we'll find that uh, the performance over the next 10 years is, is more normal. No, it's not. Microsoft rises from third to second. Apple rises from 10th to first. And the other eight stocks are all gone from the list. They're all gone. So what you find is uh, eight out of 10 companies underperformed the MSCI World Index. Um, all of those eight by enough to fall clear off the list. Brings us to 2020. Now we've got another tech heavy list. There's a couple companies here that aren't tech, Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan Chase, Visa, but seven of the 10 are tech of one sort or another. So is it another bubble? Well, yes, we think it is. How's that list faring given um, uh, how the world has evolved in the first two years of this decade? Three of the stocks are already gone. Alibaba, JP Morgan Chase, and Visa. All underperforming the world index by enough to fall clear off the list. And we have three newcomers. All of them tech. Every last one of them tech. So now we have a list where nine out of the ten largest market cap companies in the world are tech stocks. Now, the drivers of performance uh, are also fairly straightforward. This, this just shows the fourth quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022. And what you can see here is that S&P up 10%, then down 5 in the opening quarter. Uh, tech up 15 and then down 8. S&P excluding tech up 8 and then down 3. Last shall be first, first shall be last. We often see that kind of rotation in markets. So we know that Rafi has navigated the recent market shows pretty well. And turning from past to future, how does Rafi have to perform to achieve its 2% long-term excess return? And how likely do you think this is to happen? Well, let's look to the future. What we find is that um, value is often portrayed as a means of cushioning your damage in a bear market. It doesn't always happen. The bear market of 08, 09, uh, value went down more. The COVID crash, value went down more. What we find is that if you partition bear markets into bear markets where there's a bubble that is bursting, the on average uh, value outperforms by three to 4,000 basis points during those bear markets. And if it's a shock to fundamentals, not at the bursting of a bubble, it's more random. Sometimes it wins, sometimes it loses. Not widely known, uh, value wins most particularly in the first two years after a bear market ends. Now, think about it from this perspective. You have a bear market, shock to fundamentals, bubble bursting, whatever it may be. When the bear market is over, people start to look to value and, and think, gosh, uh, the damage is receding, the dangers are receding, uh, maybe we won't see a lot of these companies go bust like everyone thought, and so they get pr priced back as uh, going concerns instead of as a call option on future survival. And the result is that whether it's a bubble bursting or a shock to fundamentals, value tends to win by a wide margin in the first two years after a bubble burst. So taking the bear market, typically one year, and the subsequent two years, the excess return over that full span 
on average is three to 4,000 basis points. When a bubble bursts, it's six to 8,000 basis points. And when it's a shock to fundamentals, it's ballpark of 1,500 basis points. So this is the kind of experience we tend to see. So we've seen a bear market. We've seen a recovery. We've seen value begin to be revalued upward from a call option on whether the companies survive to a going concern valuation. And we've seen a return to, uh, to an inflationary regime. Now, one of the big changes, as Koi mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, is reemergence of inflation. It's well known that we have been on of the view that this is not transitory, going all the way back to um, uh, March of 2021. Uh, we saw a surge in inflation coming. We felt it, it's actually really simple. If you put money in people's accounts it's going to increase demand for goods and services. If you pay people to stay home, it'll reduce supply of goods and services. Supply down, demand up, means inflation. It's that simple. And there are things going on in the calculation of inflation that means that inflation is actually bigger than is commonly perceived. The most notable of those is uh, owner's equivalent rent. In the two years 2020 to 2021, uh, home prices in the U.S. rose 32% according to the Case-Shiller Index, 32% in two years. Owner's equivalent rent, which is calculated based on a survey, asking thousands of people, what do you think your home would rent for, winds up being a number pulled out of thin air that is anchoring on the last year's number, and therefore it tends to be smoothed and lagged. And the result is, over those same two years, OER rose 6%. Now, does anyone really think rent's rent equivalent value of a, of a home went up only 6% while the home price prices went up 32%? No, that difference tends to catch up, tends to roll back into OER over the next uh, two to four years. So we're going to see big inflation through 2023. Beyond that, yeah, maybe it'll mean revert. Why is that important? Value wins during inflationary regimes. In disinflation, sometimes it wins, sometimes it loses. In an inflationary regime, value tends to win. Now, we went back over uh, the past nine decades and asked the question, uh, what was the rate of inflation during that decade and how did value perform? Uh, the biggest outlier on the downside, the 1930s, well, you saw a lot of value stocks go bust because the Great Depression really was a Great Depression. In the 1970s, you saw economic dislocations, and some value stocks went bust, but most didn't and were cheap. And as a consequence of that, they outperformed the normal uh, relationship. But this is what a correlation of 80% looks like. It's not perfect. But it sure is indicative. If we're in a regime in which inflation is, let's say, 2 to 4% or higher, that's likely to bode very well for uh, value stocks performance. Now, I also think it's interesting to note that you don't only have a tailwind from inflation, you also have a tailwind from relative valuation. This graph shows where uh, value was at <clears throat> the peak of the tech bubble. That's the orange dot here, when value was one-tenth the price of growth. Um, the next seven years saw value outperform growth by well over 100 percentage points, over 100 percentage points difference spread over seven years. That's 14% that's a year. Finishing at a valuation level that was top quartile by historic standards. Over the next 13 years, we went all the way down to 0.075, a relative valuation of between 12 and 13 to 1. Good gracious. Now we're back to here, a little richer than, uh, than the uh, peak of the, uh, excuse me, yeah, a little richer than the peak of the tech bubble, but still a very, very deep discount. Now if we just go back to historic norms, that rise from 12% relative valuation to 21% works out to about 70% uh, outperformance value relative to growth. So uh, the opportunity is huge. 
So Rob, just going back to the inflation story, uh, we all know that climate awareness is getting traction among institutions. Do you think the linkage between inflation and value continues to hold for value portfolios that are carbon light? You know, it's fascinating to note. There's a, a paper um, by um, Pastor Stambaugh. Um, I've forgotten the third author's name. Um, but in any event, what they do is do a deep dive into what they call green versus brown, companies that are green versus companies that are brown. And they find, yes, performance for the green companies has been tremendous in the last decade. Um, they find that over 100% of that comes from the relative valuation of these companies getting higher, meaning people are paying a premium for these businesses and that in turn means pricing them to reflect a willingness to accept lower future returns. So in our paper, Huck and Smart Beta Go Horribly Wrong, one of our points was if a factor reval revalues upward, its past performance will look brilliant, but its future performance, if there's any mean reversion, are going to be trouble. Everyone knows value is not carbon light. Uh, energy companies are on the value side. Financial services, many of them uh, uh, aren't necessarily um, uh, pristine in terms of uh, carbon because of who they lend to and that sort of thing. Um, but the simple fact is that, that green stocks are currently expensive. I have no problem with ESG investing. I think people uh, should invest according to their conscience. And if you want a green portfolio, go for it. I do have a big problem with people saying, um, you can expect higher returns from these companies than from the companies that are less green. So on a relative valuation basis, what you see here is that as of the end of the first quarter, um, uh, value stocks were um, in the bottom decile of historic norms of relative valuation for U.S., developed EU, emerging markets, Japan, the U.K., all over the world, bottom decile. So given how cheap value is right now, would you say that tilting to value is almost like a free option for investors? Um, I think free option is, is um, a little bit um, simplistic. Uh, do I think it'll work? Absolutely. But it'll work because it's massively uncomfortable. The value stocks are really cheap because they're really out of favor. And if they're out of favor, they're usually out of favor for a reason. So I wouldn't call it a free option. I would say very high odds of success. If we stay right where we are, 98th percentile, um, you should expect the normal excess return of value relative to growth, about 4%. If you go um, back to median, You've got 7,000 basis points of excess return relative to growth, like I mentioned earlier. If you just go to the middle of the cheapest decile ever, so you're still in the cheapest decile ever, that's 2,200 basis points. So the opportunity is huge, but the timing on that is uncertain. There are scenarios in which it doesn't happen, and there's a discomfort factor that is impossible to avoid. So uh, to sum up, what you're saying is that value has twin tailwinds right now, which are inflation pressures and bargain discounts. Mm -hmm. And mean reversion isn't necessary, but if we get it, it just turbocharges both of these forces to benefit value. That's exactly right. If there's no mean reversion, the 4% would be a reasonable expectation. If it mean reverts, let's say it mean reverts over five years, 68%. Uh, gain, uh, that's hundreds of basis points per annum better than the 4.4. How likely is that? History is a wonderful gauge. Um, here we're looking at the U.S. in green, uh, global markets in blue, developed uh, markets in uh, gold, and emerging markets in orange. And on the horizontal axis, you have the relative cheapness, not of value relative to growth. Now we're looking at the relative cheapness of RAFI relative to the cap-weighted broad market. So it's U.S. RAFI versus um, uh, the Russell 1000 as an example, and so forth. 
And the vertical axis is how do they perform in the next five years. So each dot is a different starting point and shows the relative cheapness of RAFI against its subsequent outperformance. I mentioned at the beginning that if you downweight growth to its economic footprint and upweight value, you'll always have a value tilt. Our skinniest value tilt anywhere in the world has been about a 15% discount relative to the market. More typically, it's about a 25% discount. When value is fully priced, RAFI will have a skinny value tilt. And the result is mm, performance that's typically kind of neutral with a little dispersion around zero. As you move further away from full valuation for value stocks, you get bigger dispersion. Now, where it gets interesting is when it's more than one-third off, you find very few cases where RAFI fails to beat the cap-weighted market over the next five years. When it gets down in the 55 range, there's not a single episode in history where value failed to add value over the next five years. That's not to say it's impossible. It's just to say it hasn't happened. And what degree of discount do we have now? We have a discount um, for the U.S. of uh, 40% off and for emerging markets, 43% off. These are big discounts that are associated with uh, historically 98, 99% likelihood of beating the market. Uh, this, I think, is an extraordinary time to embrace um, fundamental index. It's interesting that the um, dots are so closely um, grouped across the entire world. Um, I mean, would, is there a region that you say you favor value more in, or would you say this is a broad-based opportunity globally in value, whether it's emerging markets, developed markets, U.S. or non-U.S.? I would answer yes to both. It's a broadly-based opportunity. If, if you want to have money in the U.S., which is a very fully-priced market, quite expensive, uh, value is likely to beat the market by a wide margin in the coming years if history is a guide. And RAFI, again, if history is a guide, tends to be a reliable way to beat value itself. So if value wins by the kind of margins we're looking at here, and if RAFI wins against value by its historic norms, the chance for um, uh, RAFI to be a source of great incremental return is terrific. Now, emerging markets, on the other hand, unlike the U.S., are very cheap. So emerging markets, I love the emerging markets for from a long-term investment perspective. Um, yes, they are troubled. That's why they're cheap. Narratives that create market prices and changes in narratives that create market movement have the advantage of being true. Most narratives are true. They have the disadvantage of already being in the price, so they don't help you. Emerging markets are cheap, so this basically says, if you look at the vertical axis, that in uh, in the U.S. it would be unsurprising if RAFI wins by 4% a year over the next five years, relative to a market that's expensive and may have relatively low returns. So you'll, if you go to our Asset Allocation Interactive website, you'll see our expectations for U.S. stocks are uh, two and change. So you add 4% to that, you got a 6% return. That's not brilliant. Merging markets are cheap. They're priced, again, according to the analytics we use in our Asset Allocation Interactive, they're priced to give you about an 8% return. Add 5% to that, and you're looking at 13% a year. Well, that's, that's why I like emerging markets value most. Now, with geopolitical events, emerging markets have been hit hard and I view that as a wonderful opportunity to rebalance into a larger bias. Thanks, Thanks Rob. And uh, thank you to all who have shared questions with us. While it's not possible to answer all of them here today, we've noticed a few themes that have emerged. Um, just following up on emerging markets, uh, quite a few people have asked about uh, the Russia exposure in RAFI and what's been the impact of that exposure. Um, Thank you for that question. Uh, in our Asset Allocation Interactive website, Russia has been the perennial highest return expectation market for years. Uh, people ask me about that. 
and my response has routinely been the model looks at yield plus historical growth in income plus or minus movement back towards the historic norms of valuation. Russia's always been cheap, but not this cheap. And so you'd get upward mean reversion, hence the very high return expectations. Is there a Putin component to that analysis? No. My observation all, all along has been there's a minus 100 possibility here, possibility of uh, complete expropriation of your investment. Uh, Putin is mere curial and a tough dictator. So be uh, aware of the downside risk. The high returns for Russia would presume that Putin doesn't do anything that uh, uh, spills national treasure or blood. Now, the Ukraine war is a humanitarian nightmare. It's awful. Um, it's also an enormous mistake by Putin. Um, reams have been written about the nature of the mistake, but um, he expected a cakewalk, fast success, um, sanctions which would disappear after that fast success because they'd no longer be convenient. The facts on the ground of Russia now controlling Ukraine would make it irrelevant. But he used World War II tactics and modern anti-tank uh, weaponry is just extremely powerful. Um, he's losing. Um, the impact on Rafi is very interesting. We came into the year with, depending on uh, which flavor of Rafi you're using, anywhere from 6 to 8% in Russia. Ouch! And that's Ouch. just within the emerging markets. That's within the emerging right? markets, okay. not global. The global, the right. global investment, uh, you were looking at 1% to 2%. But for the uh, emerging markets indexes, we were looking at six to eight percent allocation to, emer to within emerging markets to Russia. Uh, for the first time in history, the assets of an entire country have been marked down to zero by the index companies. So the index companies are all, including our own index company, are all presuming the value is zero. And so we had 6 to 8% of the portfolio poof, disappear. One thing that's astonishing is that our indexes beat the MSCI Emerging Markets Index in March while 6 to 8% of the portfolio is evaporating and beat the MSCI Emerging Markets Index in the first quarter by an average of about 4% even with 6 to 8% of the portfolio being taken to zero. Uh, if there is residual value and some of that can be recovered, great. We're not counting on it. But the simple fact is Rafi has fared brilliantly during this mess, not because of Russia, but because of all of the other wonderful attributes of Rafi. So uh, at this juncture, given all the wonderful attributes of Rafi, um, how should investors be using Rafi? Do you think of it as a core equity exposure or as an allocation to value? You know, I, I think it really is up to the individual investor and how they think about investing. Uh, uh, Charles Schwab views it as uh, uh, complementary, that the use of cap weight and fundamental weights together is more powerful than either. Um, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, gosh, most value managers relentlessly underperform the value indexes. They're, most of them are pretty bad at managing value portfolios. Rafi rather relentlessly, quite consistently, beats the value indexes. So to the extent that you have dedicated value exposure, why on earth would you not flip it into inexpensive Rafi strategies? Um, the my personal use of Rafi, I have nothing invested in cap weight. Uh, I'm all in because I think Rafi is a better index. But really, it depends on how you look at your own portfolio. Um, uh, 
Uh, different investors have different perspectives. My attitude is that if you find it useful, use it in whatever way you choose. Great. So you talked about how concentrated the uh, cap weight indexes right now are. Mm -hmm. um, how concentrated does RAFI get? How, how concentrated can it be relative to cap weight? It's very interesting. You saw the graph that showed the concentration of the S&P soaring and then dropping and going around. RAFI is weights companies according to how big they are. It's going to have concentration in the biggest companies, the biggest businesses. So when you look at concentration of the S&P 500, for instance, um, what you find is anywhere from 10 to 25 percent of the portfolios in the top five names. With RAFI, uh, it's likely to be over 10 percent uh, in the top five names. Um, but steady, steady over time. So the, the concentration winds up being uh, uh, less susceptible to bubbles and crashes and a basis for rebalancing. Interesting. So um, you've made a strong case for a value opportunity right now. But as you pointed out throughout this uh, conversation, Opportunities always entail risks. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the potential risks to a value outperformance playing out? I love thinking of the markets in terms of narratives. We had the narrative that the tech companies could do no wrong and we're going to take over um, uh, how we do business, how we communicate, how we um, meet friends, how we um, uh, do business with one another. Uh, and that's all happened. So narratives have a tendency to be true. The next narrative was COVID is going to cause massive freeze in the economy. Many companies won't survive. The companies that don't survive are likely mostly or all of them on the value side. So watch out. And uh, subsequent to that, we now have the narrative of Ukraine supply chain disruptions massively damaging to emerging economies which can't can't absorb this kind of stress the back-to-back -back covid mess uh, uh, devastating the emerging economies of the world followed by supply chain disruptions um, and these narratives all are an element of truth have an element of truth markets move based on changes in narratives so what narratives would work against value? Renewed lockdowns, renewed shutdowns in the macro economy would hurt value stocks. Um, supply chain disruptions that get worse, not better. Uh, tech innovations that make many of these companies irrelevant. But don't forget, disruptors get disrupted. Think back to the year 2000. 3Com spun off the company Palm, which made the ubiquitous Palm Pilot at the time. Uh, it was spun off at a value larger than 3Com before the spinoff. Wow. It quickly traded to be worth more than General Motors. Goodness. Where is Palm today? Does anyone have a Palm Pilot? Uh, if you do, I, I think there are museums that might want it. Um, the Palm was disrupted two or three years later by the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry was disrupted by the introduction of the iPhone in 2008. Disruptors disrupt past disruptors. So when you think about these companies with impenetrable moats, what if somebody finds a way to make the moat irrelevant and the company's business irrelevant? That's the nature of innovation. Be careful about overpaying for innovation because today's innovation is, to, is tomorrow's uh, stale old idea. Um, I look on this opportunity for value as truly extraordinary. I view it as relatively low risk, especially for the patient long-term investor. I would have high confidence that on a five-year basis, value will beat the market by a goodly margin and Rafi will beat value by a modest margin. I have high confidence in that. Doesn't mean I'm right. Um, but 
I also recognize that as you look at shorter and shorter spans, uh, you can get a bolt from the blue that uh, knocks things completely off, off sides. We're not done with COVID. Maybe there's another variant that's worse than Alpha coming down the pike. Maybe we have renewed lockdowns. If that happens, I think it creates a chance to take another bite at the apple, a chance to rebalance into value even cheaper than today. Well, thanks, Rob. Um, I think I'm going to go home and dig out that old Palm Pilot and send it to that museum you reference. <laughs> uh, but that's all we have time for today. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us and for your questions. And we apologize that we didn't have time to answer all the questions that were submitted. Our contact information is on your screen. Please reach out to us if you'd like more information. And lastly, please take a few minutes to answer a quick three question survey at the bottom of the screen. You, your feedback is very valuable to us. Have a great day and thank you again. Thank you all very much for your time.